All right, in this lecture, I'm going to cover stress at a point, states of stress. This is a, a really important issue. And uh, one thing I'll say is that we often um, fail to think of stress in the right way as geotechnical engineers. We always need to think of stress as a, a tensor-based quantity rather than uniaxial. All right, it's really easy for us to think of uniaxial stress. So you take a piece of rebar, you pull on it, there's a cross-sectional area, there's a force, it's easy to compute the stress in that direction. When we go to soil mechanics, things are not so simple, right? We don't have a uniaxial bar that we put a building on. It's a continuum. So when we load the surface of the soil, there's a complicated stress that involves stresses in a lot of different directions. We need to always be careful to think about stress in the right way. So that's why it's good to go through this review of stress at a point. A lot of this will be a review of your, your strength of materials course, uh, but there are some differences in soil mechanics that I'll talk about. So first of all, why do we need to know about stress at a point? Well, a lot of the time we might have some kind of a surface load. Let's say that we have a foundation, a building is, is putting weight on the ground, and that can be represented by this uh, pressure distribution and then if we look below the ground surface at a, some soil element, we might want to know what is the state of stress acting on that soil element. And then we can compare it with the strength of the soil and see if that stress condition is going to cause the soil to fail. Or we could also figure out how much strain there's going to be in that soil element and then relate all that strain and all the elements below the soil into some kind of surface displacement. So that would mean how much is the structure going to settle. But an important first step is figuring out what is the state of stress for the soil element. So if we look here, I'm, I'm taking the soil element, kind of blowing it up here so you can actually see the stress conditions. Um, there are nine different stresses acting on the soil element. So the way that we'll label these stresses is that there are two indices. So this top one right there, sigma ZZ. It's acting on a plane that's perpendicular to the Z direction. So there's our plane. And notice that our Z direction is vertical in this case. We always have to have a coordinate system. Um, so sigma ZZ is acting perpendicular to the Z direction on that plane. Therefore, the first letter is Z. And it's also acting in the Z direction. So the second letter is also Z. Okay, and then we go to this next stress component. It's also acting on the z-plane because it's perpendicular to the z-plane. But uh, it's now acting in the y-direction, this way. So I'm going to label the stresses such that the stress label is at the beginning of the stress vector away from the arrow bed. Okay, and then if we look at this vector, it goes with this label and it's sigma zx. Similarly, here's the x-plane right, because it's perpendicular to the x direction. So we have sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma xz, and then we can do the same thing for the y plane, perpendicular to the y direction, and we get three uh, stress components there. All right, so what we can now do is put those stress components all together to form a rank two tensor. Okay, rank two just means there's two dimensions. So here's the stress, and the stress is a tensor-based quantity. All right, it's not just a stress in a particular direction. We have to think of it as being this whole tensor with all nine quantities in there. Uh, so on the top row, we have all of the stresses that are acting on the X plane. On the second row, all of the stresses acting on the Y plane. And on the third row, stresses acting on the Z plane. So the, this is the Cauchy stress tensor. This tells us all of the information that we need to know about the stress condition at a point in a continuum. There's nothing additional that we could ever have. If we take things away from this, which we will do in just a minute, I'll explain why, uh, then we actually are missing information, right? So this is the minimum set of information we need to fully know the stress condition, and we can't have any more information than that. So the Cauchy stress tensor is kind of it. Uh, okay, the, the Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric. So it has this property that um, stresses with the same letters are the same regardless of the order in which those letters appear. So sigma xx is equal to sigma yx. That means that this cell is equal to that cell. zx is equal to xz, right? These two are equal. And then yz is equal to zy. So those two are equal. It's symmetric. It means that this part of the stress tensor is the same as that part of the stress tensor. 
And in reality, even though we have nine numbers or nine values in the stress tensor, there are only six unique values, right? The numbers on the diagonal and then the values that are on the off diagonal because once we know those, then we know these two. So they're not, you know, we only need to know six different numbers to fully know the stress tensor. All right, now um, let's talk about the sign convention for stress. In um, strength of materials, you probably use the sign convention where tension is positive. Um, and in fact, if you look at the stresses that I drew, it would kind of make sense to make tension positive because that would be in the upward Z direction. All right, now uh, we do things differently in soil mechanics just because of the nature of soil material. All right, if you imagine that this is a little cube of sand and all the grains are pushed against each other, Okay, you can't pull on the sand, right? It's not going to sustain that tensile stress. It'll just fall apart. Whereas it can sustain compression. You can push on it. You just can't pull on the sand. Um, well, it would be really annoying to constantly have negative signs. If uh, we can have compression but not tension, we would just have negative signs all over the place in soil mechanics. So we adopt the opposite sign convention. Compression is positive for us, just so that we don't have to write those negative signs all the time. So that's, that's one thing that's a little different from your 108 class. So what I've done here is drawn in two dimensions, right? So we only have Z and X here. These, um, these are positive stresses shown here in this cell. So compressive stress in the Z direction, compressive stress in the X direction. And then the shear stresses are positive this way because they would tend to make the element deform in such a way that the slope here is positive, right? So um, that's why those shear stresses are positive. So anyway, if you get confused, you can always just come back to this diagram and look at what the sign conventions are. And then uh, similarly, um, or conversely, these are negative stresses, right? So tensile stresses going up or out, and then shear stresses that tend to make the soil deform in a way that that slope would be negative, right? So uh, fairly straightforward, just keep in mind those are the sign conventions. All right, now, one thing that I've done, too, in going from page one of my notes to page two of my notes is I've switched from three dimensions to two dimensions, right? Up here on page one, I had to draw this three-dimensional diagram, had, you know, three different faces on which the stresses were acting, but of course there's also the other three stresses that are not visible, so six total faces there. And we had a three by three rank two tensor. Uh, okay, now, here, I went to two dimensions. That's so much easier to draw, right? Because I'm drawing on a flat surface that's two dimensional. So a lot of the time, because of simplicity, we ignore one of the directions. We only include two coordinates. Um, so although we live in a 3D world, we often ignore the stresses that correspond to one of the directions, and we simplify our lives a lot. And we'll do this a lot in this class. Okay, we'll take the 3D world, simplify it to a 2D world, just because it's easier. That doesn't make it correct. Okay, one thing to remember is that when we do two-dimensional coordinate systems, we're actually doing it wrong. We are ignoring information that might potentially be important, but we're doing it because we make our lives a lot easier. Uh, and we can do things like the Mohr circle, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, in the next lecture. So here's what we have now, right? Instead of a three by three tensor, we have a two by two tensor. And I write here, wait, what about sigma yx, sigma xy, sigma yz, sigma zy, and sigma yy? Okay, well, in real life, they exist, right? We, we have a uh, xz coordinate system here, so we're just ignoring the y stresses. In real life, they exist. We're just, we're saying, we don't care about you right now, y value stresses. We're just gonna make our life simple by getting rid of you. All right, so much simpler, but we're ignoring potentially important information. And I just always want you to remember that this is not correct. It's just simple. Um, okay, now let's talk about coordinate transformation. This is a really important concept here because it sets up um, how we compute principal stresses and stress invariance. Um, and it also has application to the Mohr circle, which is a graphical representation of a coordinate transformation. So uh, let's say that we know the stresses on vertical and horizontal planes. We know that the sigma zz, sigma xx, and 
you know, sigma x, z, and z, x are the same, so we only have to know one number and then we know the other one too. But, but let's say that we wanted to know the stresses oriented on some rotated plane. And uh, there are a number of reasons why we might want to do this. Like, for example, we know them on this plane, and then we're worried about uh, sliding or something along an inclined plane. Maybe there's a slope stability problem, and we're worried about what's the shear stress acting on that plane that might cause this mass to slide. So there are real reasons that are physical for us to want to rotate coordinates a lot of the time. We're doing it here just to motivate um, principal stress derivation. All right, so what we do is we rotate the coordinate by an angle theta, and we have a new coordinate system, z hat and x hat. All right, so we have new stresses. These stresses all change now when we rotate the coordinate system. We get sigma z z hat, sigma z x and x z hat, and then sigma x x hat. And the way that we can calculate those stresses is to use the coordinate transformation tensor, which I'm calling lowercase a here. All right, so we have the uh, stresses on the rotated coordinate plane. This is a two by two stress tensor sigma hat is equal to a, which is this two by two tensor, cosine theta, minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. Then we multiply it by sigma, and then we multiply it by a transpose. So notice that the signs, um, the negative sign on the sign terms have switched. So this is a, this one's a transpose. Or stated really simply, sigma hat is equal to a times sigma times a transpose, right? Where each one of these is a, is a tensor now. Um, okay, well, this is not too difficult for us to do. The matrix algebra is super easy. You can multiply this one through, then get the resulting two by two tensor and multiply it by this one. And if you do that, you'll find that you can get pretty short closed form expressions for sigma x x hat, sigma z z hat, and sigma x z hat. So we're done, right? We've got these rotated coordinate, you know, we've got these stresses on some rotated coordinate plane. And you know, maybe we would want to look at how big is sigma x z hat, that's the shear stress acting on that plane compared to the shear strength of the soil. That might tell us whether or not the uh, slope is going to fail, something like that. Um, OK, but let's take it a little bit further. What, what I'm going to do is say, let's, let's look at this equation down here. right? What we can do is set this number equal to 0. What if we set sigma xz hat equals 0? Well, we can then solve for the value of theta. So how much do we have to rotate it? It turns out that there's always at least one angle of theta where you can rotate it and the shear stress is acting on, um, on planes perpendicular and parallel to that direction, R0. Okay, at least one. Sometimes, um, anyway, I'll get into that later, but there's always at least one rotation angle. I'm going to call it theta sub p for any stress tensor for which the shear stresses are equal to zero right, on planes perpendicular and parallel to that direction. So we, we have the equation here. I've just set sigma x equals zero there and uh, substituted in theta p instead of theta. And then we can solve for theta p, and you get this equation. 1 half inverse tangent of 2 sigma xz divided by sigma zz minus sigma xx. Um, OK, now the reason why I'm using a subscript p is that it turns out that these are the principal stress directions, right? So that rotation angle defines the principal stress planes. And those principal stress planes are associated with the principal stresses, sigma 1 and sigma 3. All right, so now all we have to do to compute the principal stresses is take this principal stress rotation angle theta p and substitute it into these expressions up here for, sorry, substituted into those two expressions for sigma xx hat and sigma zz hat. And then we're computing, we know that the shear stresses are zero on that plane, now we're computing the normal stresses, and those are equal to the principal stresses sigma 1 and sigma 3. So what I'll do here, I'm going to define sigma hat xxp as being one of the principal stresses and sigma hat zzp as being the other principal stress. We don't know ahead of time which one's sigma 1 and which one's sigma 3. All right, and the reason is that by definition, let me write down the notes so that it's in here. Okay, by definition, 
uh, sigma 1 has to be greater than or equal to sigma 3. You can never have a case where sigma 3 is greater than sigma 1. Okay? So we've plugged in the, the equations. Pretty simple. We've gotten these expressions for the principal stresses. Now we just have to figure out which one's bigger. So sigma 1 is the maximum of those two. It's the major principal stress. And sigma 3 is the minimum of those two. It's the minor principal stress. Right? So sigma 3 is the smaller one, minor principal stress. Now these two might be equal to each other if you have a hydrostatic stress condition. So like if you have standing water, the vertical and horizontal stresses are the same. There can be no shear stress because water has no shear strength. So no matter how you rotate the coordinates, you're always going to have the same stresses. Sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3. Um, otherwise, they will be different. Okay, now we've gone through this whole thing of doing these equations and coordinate transformations and all this stuff. It turns out that there's mathematically a much easier way to calculate principal stresses. And simply stated, sigma 1 and 3 are the eigenvalues of the stress tensor. Right? So a lot of software packages these days allow us to quickly compute eigenvalues. And if you were to set up a stress tensor with these components in it, and then use Python or MATLAB or any kind of program that has an eigenvalue function, you'll find that the numbers that you get out are equal to sigma 1 and sigma 3. So if you ever have to write a code to solve these, the, the eigenvalues code is probably much shorter and simpler than writing out these long equations. When I'm writing code, I always get lost in all those parentheses, fewer parentheses if you just do eigenvalues. And I'll, I'll demonstrate this um, in, in a separate lecture, that the eigenvalues command, in fact, does give you the same answer as those other longer equations. Uh, okay, now the last thing that we'll talk about in this lecture is the idea of stress invariance. So uh, it turns out that sigma 1 and sigma 3 remain the same upon coordinate transformation. So let me, let me just go back and talk about what I mean by that. Let's say that we have this stress condition right here, right? Um, well, we can go in and compute the eigenvalues. You could populate a tensor with these numbers right there and compute eigenvalues. Uh, and then you could do the coordinate rotation by multiplying through this whole thing right here, right? And now you have new stress values, and you could put those into a tensor equation. Sorry, I'm having trouble circling things here. And, and you would have a different stress tensor, right? So the stress tensor with these numbers would be different than the stress tensor with these numbers over there. It turns out, though, that the eigenvalues are the same. So if you set up this tensor and compute the eigenvalues here, it's the same as if you set up that stress tensor and compute those eigenvalues. I'll, I'll demonstrate that as well. Um, that the eigenvalues don't depend on the coordinate system. So that's kind of nice. Sigma 1 and 3 are kind of properties of the overall stress condition. It doesn't matter what the coordinate system is that you look at. So uh, since they don't depend on, on coordinate directions, we call them invariants, meaning that they are invariant of, they don't depend on the coordinate system at all. Right? Now the individual stress components themselves do. Those things do change, right? So Vertical stress is not the same as the stress acting on a rotated plane, but the invariants sigma 1 and 3 are the same. Okay, what that means is that any functions that we form of the invariants are also invariants themselves, right? So we're going to define two really important invariants here for soil mechanics. The first one is the mean stress, and as implied by the name, we just take the average of sigma 1 and sigma 3. So P is sigma 1 plus sigma 3 over 2. And keep in mind, these definitions are uh, two-dimensional. We'll talk about three-dimensional uh, definitions. Um, this is also 2D. We'll talk about the more fundamental, correct, three-dimensional definitions in the next lecture. Um, but these are the two-dimensional ones. All right, and then P and Q. So I don't remember if I defined Q. Q is sigma 1 minus sigma 3. That's the deviator stress, or the deviatoric stress invariant. So P and Q also remain constant, even if we rotate the coordinate system. And basically what we'll find is that these two stress invariants are really important for us for defining the strength 
and then looking at whether the strength is being exceeded. Right? It turns out that the strength of soil depends on the mean stress. If you put a lot of pressure on sand particles, they're pressed together really strong and firm, it has more strength than if there's not very much pressure uh, pushing them together. All right, and then the deviator stress, Q, is sigma 1 minus sigma 3. That's a measure of how different are the, the two principal stresses. I mentioned hydrostatic, like for water, they're the same. Sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3, so Q would be equal to 0. If Q gets bigger, there's more shear stress acting on the soil, and it's more likely to fail. All right, so that's it for this lecture, and we'll talk about three-dimensional stresses and then more circles and other, uh, other things in uh, future lectures.